Johnny Dollar. St. Clair, Mr. Dollar, and Kenneth, Missouri. Would it be possible for you to come out here right away? Kenneth, Miss... What did you say your name is? Yeah, Charles Kingsley St. Clair. I, I'm... Oh, yeah, with Providential Assurance Company. Yes, that's right. Yeah, now, wait a minute. I thought you were leaving the company. Uh, Dollar. you're such a gentleman, you just couldn't stand doing business with the poor, wretched clients you inherited. Uh, Mr. Dollar, I am a changed man. Well, good for you. It is true that some of the people that I've been sent down here to deal with, well, I... I consider them nothing more than poor white trash, ignorant, illiterate. Well, I'll say this for them. They sure know how to make some pretty powerful moonshine. Right, very true. Yeah, if one of those characters hadn't poured some of that white mule down my gullet, I doubt if I'd have been crazy enough to go out after that killer. But thanks to you, Dade Whipperman was indicted, tried, found guilty, and has been incarcerated. Yeah, that was the one, Dade Whipperman. Unfortunately, Mr. Dollar, Dade has a brother. His name is Daniel. Dade, yeah, I beg your pardon. Daniel. He's been making trouble, very serious trouble. Oh, like what? Murders. I see. So if uh, you take a plane to Memphis, I shall be more than glad to meet you there. Oh, now look, mister, I was lucky once. Got out of that swamp country alive. But I'd be nuts to stick my neck out again. And since those people already know who I am, what my job is... <sighs> okay, St. Clair, I'll grab a plane. <laughs> CBS Radio brings you Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Providential Assurance Company office in Kennett, Missouri. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the deadly swamp matter. Item one is 7645 Plain Fair, Hartford to Memphis. Charles Kingsley St. Clair met me as promised. And apparently the man had changed considerably from the snooty, better-than-thou stuff shirt I'd found him to be on my first trip. Yes, Mr. Dollar, in spite of my earlier feelings about the clients my predecessor had left me... Yeah, I know, Mr. St. Clair. But those moonshiners and such existing in that 20-mile swamp are hardly typical of the folks living around Kennett, where your office is. Oh, I realize that now, and I shall stay in Kennett, try to justify the company's confidence in placing me there. Very good. Nevertheless, when I came to this part of the country, the swamp people were the only ones with whom I had to deal. They were the only ones to whom he had sold insurance, and... When I saw the horrible, dirty, squalid way in which they lived in those broken-down shacks full of vermin... Kind of turned your stomach, huh? Uh, Quite frankly, it did exactly that. Uh, That's why I requested transfer to our New England offices. But now, of course, I plan to stay down here. Now, um, when you came here before, you taught me a great lesson in how to deal with them, how to understand them. Yeah? By having my car wrecked for me, by getting shot at and nearly drowned in that swamp. But you succeeded in enlisting the help, the cooperation of the uh, good ones among them. Earning their respect. Well, I had to do something to get out of there alive. The point is that you did. You have friends among them now, and you'll be willing to help you again. Yeah, well, that's something that... Oh, now, wait a minute. Yeah. You mean these murders you call me about? They're back in that swamp country, too? Oh, great. Oh, no, 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 Mr. And I thought that maybe for once... Okay, St. Clair, let's have it. What's it all about? As I told you, a series of murders. So you're having to pay out a lot of insurance. No. And you think that I can somehow, miraculously, put a stop to... Huh? Did I hear you say no somewhere along the line? Oh, the victims of these murders have, uh... Well, they've been... Well, relatives of some of my clients. Up in the swamp country? Up in the swamp country. Well... Clients whom you know, whom you met when you were here before. Go on. And thanks to you and what you did for them, they regard the company, and therefore me, and you, as a kind of, well, as a protective agency. A protection for them, with, with only their best interests at heart. That sort of thing is very good for the company. Yeah. Uh, shall we stop for some lunch? Yeah, sure, go ahead and stop if you like. But if you think you can talk me into med- meddling into these murders when it's a job for the law... But it's not for the law. 
What do you mean by that? Well, as I told you before, these uh, these people living far beyond any town or city limit, they're pretty much a law unto themselves. Well, yeah, that I know. And the local police leave them alone. They have no jurisdiction. So what about the state authorities? Well, that region of the big swamp pretty much straddles the state line. Oh. Neither state wants it. Then I can't blame them. In any event, when a murder occurs, by the time jurisdiction is established... Uh, this dollar... Well... Do you remember the beneficiary of the policy you came down here to pay off with the insurance money? Mm. A Ufa Crump. That's right. Yeah, real sweet, pretty young kid. Yes. St. Clair, I'll never forget the look in her eyes, the almost childish, unabashed gratitude when I gave her that money. Yes. Now she can have pretty clothes for a change, good food on the table. Oh, she no. can fix up that little house she and her kids live in, buy some lace curtains for the windows, and... Oh, what do you mean, no? Yufa was the latest victim of this killer. What? Come on, St. Clair. Tell me what you know so I can get to work on this thing. And now, Act Two of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Eufa Crump. Yeah, what a name. But that cute, intelligent little girl, really out of place in the swamp country. Well, regardless of how you or I or the law might feel about it, her inheriting that moonshine still, when her husband was killed a while back, had meant something to provide for both her and her children. And the insurance she received on top of it. And she planned to marry Cass Dingle, the character who'd befriended me, who'd helped me run down her husband's killer. Cass, who was going to leave this desolate country, get out on the world and make an honest living for her. Yeah, but it was Cass who'd sacrificed his life out there in the swamp in order to save mine. No, Mr. Dollar. What? Cass Dingle is still alive. But I myself saw Dade Whopperman shoot him in the back. You for somehow nursed him back to health. They were married according to whatever rights the swamp people observe, and they were very happy. And then she was murdered. Yes, that was Cass who asked me to call on you again. And since you know him, you know these people. Okay, you know... stop wasting time, St. Clair. Get me on up to Kennett where I can rent a car and get on this thing. Well, if you'll drop me at my office, I'll be more than glad to let you have this one. <laughs> uh, but uh, about some lunch. Lunch? Forget it. Let's get going. Item 2, 470 for a tank full of gas there in Kennett. And I headed west a few miles, then due north into the swamp country. Well, as I said before, the 20-mile swamp is one of the most dismal, uninviting places I've ever seen. The road after a while wasn't even a road, just a set of muddy wagon tracks. More than once, driving slowly and carefully along, I held my breath, hoping St. Clair's car wouldn't bog down in some mud hole. I passed a couple of shacks, falling apart and apparently vacant. But the distinctive smell of moonshine whiskey in the air told me otherwise, that a still was in full operation. If Cass Dingle had married Yufa, he'd gone to her place to live, so I headed that way. But a mile or so before I got there, edging the car around a thicket of wild blackberries... I had learned the last time I was here that when somebody starts shooting, the only thing to do is stop whatever you're in, whatever you're doing. So I did, fast. I ducked down under the wheel on the floorboards, and I pulled out my gun, and I waited. Johnny, is that you, Miss Johnny? Who are you? It's Cass, Miss Johnny. Cass Dingle. Oh, good, good. Only what was the idea of pulling off a couple of shots? Howdy, Miss Johnny. I'm glad you come, sir. Yeah, oh, yeah. I knew maybe a shot would make you stop the car, Miss Johnny. And that way you wouldn't go on up to the house in the still. Yeah, well, that's where I was headed, to look for you. It's much better you hide this car back in my old cabin. You remember where it is? little turn-off right up ahead, isn't it? Yes, sir. 
Now you do that, and I'll cut through the swamp and meet you there. Sure, whatever you say. I'll meet you there. I should have got there in five or six minutes at the most. The car bogged down in the sticky black mud hole. By the time I pulled enough twigs and branches under the wheels to get traction and make the turn off and pull up in front of his place, more than half an hour had passed. Because of his shortcut through the woods and the swamp, I'd expected to find Cass out in front waiting for me. But he wasn't, though the door of his cabin was ajar. Now, if I'd had any sense, I would have stopped for a minute and I'd have given some thought to that. But I didn't. And believe me, it was a mistake. Come in, mister. Come right in. In the dark, windowless cabin, I could see Cass Dingle on a bunk at the far end, tightly bound with ropes and rawhide, looking at me helplessly. I said, come in. And standing in front of me was the biggest, most ugly man I've ever seen. 250 pounds at the least, built like a gorilla. His face was covered with coarse black stubble. His long hair straggled down into the back of the collar of his dirty shirt. Aimed at my chest was an ancient rifle with a bore almost big enough for a shotgun. That's better, mister. Now, Peter, Luke, John. Three specters came forward out of the shadows. Smaller men, also dirty, unshaven, looking no less menacing than the man in front of me. Each of them had a rifle. I could feel one of them against my backbone. Now, listen, I took a course once from the FBI on the proper procedure for disarming a man who has a gun in your back. But they forgot to tell me what to do about four of them. So I raised my hands up over my head. That's right, Mr. Johnny. Now you just keep them hands right up straight. You, Paul? Yes, Daniel. Daniel. Daniel Wopperman. All right now, Paul. You've taken Mr. Johnny's gun away from him. Yes, now I will, Daniel. Yes, you've taken it away from him, Paul. I got it, Daniel. Ooh, it's a real pretty one. That's right, Paul. So you holding on to it real careful, so and I won't damage it none, while and I kill him. And now, Act Three of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar and the Deadly Swamp Matter. I've been in some pretty tough spots in this crazy job of mine, but nothing ever quite like this. Four men, like four vicious animals, who crawled up out of the muck of the 20-mile swamp, armed with ancient rifles I was sure they knew how to use and use well. For a man living and moonshining in this godforsaken country depended on his gun for survival. Survival. It was obvious by the way the guns were aimed that survival was the one thing they didn't plan for me. Like four vicious animals, I said. Stupid, maybe. Enough to be tricked somehow. Yeah, but how? And there wasn't anyone within miles to give me a hand. Except for Cass Dingle tied down on the bunk at the far end of the cabin, helpless. If only he were bright enough to... Then the ugly giant in front of me talked again. That's right. Daniel Wupperman, and I'm going to kill you, Mr. Johnny. Right now, for it being that you sent my brother Dade up into prison. He was a killer, Daniel. The same as you are. That's right. So one more killer, namely you, it ain't going to make me no worse than I am. Why, Daniel? Because you had no business to come here to begin. We don't like that here, Miss Fall. No, no, I mean, why these other killings? Why murder Eufa? Cass's wife. Why you do that, Daniel? Because it was her insurance money, Mr. Johnny, brought you here the first time. Then you put my brother in jail. So you murdered her, a harmless young mother, just to get me back here. That's right. Now I'm going to kill you. You stand away from him backing him. This charge gonna go right on through him. Yes, Daniel. But now you no, should... No, Daniel, no. It's all wrong you killed Miss Johnny. You shut up, Cass. Maybe... Maybe Cass, he thinking what I thinking, Daniel. Miss Johnny, he from the outside. You kill an outside man. Maybe they all... Maybe the police, they moving in on us. They coming here in the swamp because he from the outside. You stop thinking, Paul. You move away now so I can kill him. No, Dan. Shut up, Cass. 
Ah, uh, Mr. Johnny. No, Dan, or you kill me instead. Now you kill my wife, you, if I don't care. You kill me instead, Daniel. I kill you, Cass. Soon I kill Miss Johnny. Miss Johnny? That's... That's all right, Cass. No, Miss Johnny, that ain't... What? I mean, I talk long enough. What can you say, Cass? Must be nearing to five o'clock by now, Miss Johnny. Five? Shut up, Cass, and what do you mean by that? Miss Johnny, no. Oh, yeah, you're right. What do you mean by five o'clock? Yeah, yeah, Cass, they ought to... I mean, it's about time. What do you mean, Miss Johnny? What, uh, nothing, not a thing, Daniel. I just whistle. That's all. I mean, what do you mean about five o'clock? You tell me. Oh. Tell me. Oh. Tell me. Be because it's nothing you can do anything about. It. Because if it is five o'clock, then by the time you can pull that trigger. You tell me. All right. If I'm not safely out of this swamp by five o'clock, this place will be so full of state police. Well... Would you like to look at my watch? No, you keeping your hands up over your head. Oh, sure. Because you lying, Mr. Johnny. Am I? You lying to me. Just keep on talking, Daniel. You'll give more time. But if I were you... I said I gonna kill you, Mr. Johnny. And no scheming words out in your mouth gonna... Gonna... You, Paul. I... He ain't heard nobody out there, Daniel. You go out. You go look out along the slough and the bio. Yes, Daniel. You see anybody in any boat, you shoot off that gun. You, Peter, you go on back the road and look. And you, John, you go look up by Cass Still. You don't see no one. You come back here and help me bury Cass and Miss Johnny in the ground. Now you go. Yes, Daniel, come on, you. And the three of them, like so many shadows, slipped off into the growing darkness. Cass Dingle Stalling is talking as though something would happen at five o'clock had gained time for us. And more important, had reduced the immediate enemy to one. But Daniel's rifle was still aimed at my midsection. Then after plenty of time for the others to have looked around. You see, Miss Johnny, you trying to bluff me is all. But that's no good. Because you haven't heard from them, Daniel? That means the police have taken them. Without them getting off a shot? No, Miss Johnny. And I tell you that by five o'clock, and it must be five o'clock by now. It's getting dark, Miss Johnny. Yeah. Let, uh, let me look at my watch. You keep your hands right up straight. It's long after five o'clock. Me, I prove it. I look at your little watch. Oh, yeah? You think I can't tell the time? Oh, I'm sure you can, Daniel. But don't you move, Miss Johnny. Because I'm keeping this right in the middle of your belly. Yes. <coughs> and you try and grab and I pull the trigger. Okay. Okay. Uh, easy. Easy. Slowly. And see. Cautiously. The barrel of the gun still in my belly. He looked upward toward the watch on my wrist. And I turned my wrist ever so slightly away from him so that he had to twist his head a bit. Just a little. Long about uh, 10, 15, maybe. Then I brought up my knee with everything I had. No! you! I knew the sound of the gunshot would bring the others back to the cabin. After all, they certainly hadn't found any sign of those mythical state police out there. So after setting Cass free, I lay down just inside the door looking very dead. And then when Paul and John and Peter came in one at a time, Cass, who was standing back at the door, quietly and carefully took care of them with the help of the butt of Daniel's gun. So now four more of the swampers have left that region to spend a long, long time behind the bars. 
Expense account total, including the trip back to Hartford, $161.60. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's program. Next week, a thrilling, hair-raising chase out on the open sea. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Ben Wright, Sam Edwards, Roy Glenn, and Vic Farron. 